Well, with new cases emerging every day, there are lots of questions on the minds of many of you. And Dr. Isaac Bogosh is a, an infectious disease specialist from Toronto's University Health Network. He joins us now, and we're going to try to answer as many of your questions as we can. And uh, doctor, let's start with this. How contagious is this virus? It's a great question because we still don't actually have the answer to that. We know it's contagious enough that it can be transmitted from person to person, but the question of how easily is it transmitted from person to person still remains unknown. And what does it do if, if somebody is infected? What does it do to their body? We know people will have uh, the involvement up of the upper respiratory tract, and it certainly has shown clinical evidence to move to the lower respiratory tract and cause evidence of pneumonia. So people are presenting with fevers, coughs, and shortness of breath. And sometimes on uh, some of the data we're getting from China, we've seen some evidence of x-rays that have evidence of pneumonia in it. So another question people have, how deadly is this virus? Yeah, I think there's still a lot unknown about this virus. And we've heard about some of the deaths associated with it. But what we don't really know is what proportion of people who are infected have a severe illness and end up succumbing to this illness. How likely is it that there are many people, for example, in China who have this virus or are infected by it, but the authorities don't even know about it and they survive. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, we certainly are hearing about people who have tested positive. The question is, are those people that tested positive a group of individuals who are just a little bit sicker and they ended up going to seek medical attention. So it's a bit of a, what we call a selection bias and we're selecting for a sicker group of people. And what's, what's currently unknown is, are there uh, a larger group of people that might not have been sick enough and not, might not have had severe enough symptoms to seek medical attention, but still had this infection? There is a number of people, there are a number of people, and I may be among them, when you hear about a disease, all of a sudden you start feeling like you have the symptoms of those diseases. And uh, it is flu season in Canada, and I'm sure some people are curious about the differences between the coronavirus and, and flu. Let's talk about uh, th those symptoms, that, that kind of cluster of symptoms. Yeah, it's, I think it's going to be very difficult to distinguish between the two of these uh, just on, on a clinical spectrum alone. Both of them can cause fever, both of them can cause shortness of breath, both of them can cause a cough. So I think it's very, it will be very challenging just to look at clinical behavior and, and uh, tease this apart. I th the real key here is if someone's had uh, recent travel to China or perhaps a recent exposure to someone that might have had this, I mean, that's going to be the that's going to be the kickoff. Which I think we've seen so far. For example, the, the case diagnosed in Chicago is somebody who came to Chicago from not just China, but I think Wuhan, right? So we're seeing kind of those, those direct connections, uh, at least to this point. You know, yesterday there was a lot of coverage and news alerts on, on the cable channels, for example, about how this had not yet been declared a global health emergency. Why not, do you think? I think they're still debating whether or not this constitutes a global health emergency. And certainly the message from the World Health Organization was that this is an emergency in China. And they also mentioned that, you know, this is a, a rapidly evolving situation and they, they still may declare this a global health emergency in the coming days. But as of yesterday, they didn't feel that there was enough of an international concern to declare this a global health emergency. And, you know, international concern, it's going to take, I think, an international effort to try to deal with this. And so from where you're sitting, is, is China doing enough? Yeah, it's actually impressive at how transparent China has been and uh, the steps that China has taken to really get this under control. Certainly from the very beginning, uh, it, it was only about two weeks after we heard of uh, the grumblings of this epidemic uh, in, in Wuhan, where we had uh, Chinese scientists uh, essentially get the, the genetic sequence of this virus and make it publicly available to the world. We've had constant updates from the Chinese Centers for Disease Control and more local public health uh, groups in, in Wuhan and in surrounding cities release some data and some information about what they're seeing, uh, some of their case numbers. So we've had a lot of information from China. It appears to be uh, vastly different from the experience in 2002 and 2003. Sure is nice getting your answers to these questions. Thank you very much. Oh, anytime.